2002 planning board meeting. Uh, we have a lot of correspondence in front of us, and I'm going to allow the members to take a couple minutes to get caught up on it before we start this meeting. Meeting, you have the minutes of the previous January 15th meeting in front of you. Uh, do I have any corrections or admissions? Mr. Chairman, I move that the minutes be accepted as presented. And so moved. Second. Moved second. and seconded. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, then all those in favor accepting the minutes of the January 15th meeting, so raised by writing your, raising your right hand. Minutes are accepted and approved. <clears throat> we have in front of us tonight some correspondence. We have an email from Mr. and Mrs. Marston regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Benini regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from T. Dyer regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a mem memorandum from the town manager regarding Haskell Private Access Way Permit. We have a letter from Colin Brown regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from Acting Town Attorney regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a memorandum from the Conservation Commission regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have the Planning Commissioner's Journal, Winter 2002. We have a Cape Elizabeth land area zoning chart. <clears throat> In addition, we received this evening a letter from Lee Bumstead regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from William Bray regarding traffic impacts of proposed Roadwood, Rosewood Division. We have a letter from Bernstein, Shaw, Soria, Nelson regarding Blueberry Ridge. And we have a letter from Christopher and Jane Bolas regarding Blueberry Ridge. And with that, uh, the first item on our agenda this evening is Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Mr. Fristacci is requesting a major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for the 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road. The application was deemed complete at the November meeting and a public hearing was held in December. The application will be reviewed for compliance with six, section 16-2-4, major subdivision review, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit regulations. Would, uh, so, would you like to bring us up to date at this point, please? Thank you. My name is Joe Pistacci. I'm the proposed developer of Blueberry Ridge subdivision, and just to um, acquaint you again with where this is located. It's in the triangular portion which abuts South Portland here. The land that we are developing is the land in the green. Since our last meeting, I believe the town council has accepted the donation of the pond area. Uh, there was a question at the last meeting as to how we handle the total area. On the plan that was submitted to you uh, and before you now, the total area that's being developed is 486,055 square feet. Um, the net area that will be developed is 380,002 square feet. Uh, the amount of open space then computes to 62 percent that will be donated to the town. We are proposing 19 lots in this subdivision and the allowable amount of uh, lots uh, based on the net residential density calculations is 25. At the last meeting you asked me to provide information regarding uh, traffic impact. William Bray 
has submitted two letters. One, the first one regarding the uh, impact of traffic if Edgewood and Red Oak Drive were to be a continuation. The second one was to be, uh, is something you received this evening, and that is on the uh, impact of any cut through traffic from Mitchell Road to uh, Short, uh, Cottage Road, South Portland. The, um, I think you received letters from the two owners in South and Cape Elizabeth, um, Brown Associates and uh, Chris Bolas, regarding their interest in whether the, the uh, they would cede their rights in the Edgewood um, Edgewood Road. The there are several comments that were. Um, result of Steve Harding's um, review of the subdivision packet and they've been passed on to the engineer he's reviewing those and will make the uh, appropriate adjustments for the next meeting. Uh, this evening I do have two individuals that will answer drainage and landscape uh, issues. Uh, Tom Emery uh, who's familiar to this board, former member, and Dave Camilla both from land use consultants. I think at this time, uh, someone will start it off. Unless, unless you have questions of me of the, what I've already discussed. I guess we can proceed then, thanks. My name is Tom Emery. I'm a registered landscape architect with Land Use Consultants. Uh, we were asked to review the uh, street planting plan and also look at the buffering issue uh, for the uh, Blueberry Ridge uh, subdivision. In so doing, we walked the site on several occasions, photographed the property line, uh, and uh, made uh, several proposals uh, through coordination and discussion with Mr. Fustacci. Uh, essentially, what we're looking at is uh, under the the proposal that's in front of you now is a, is a buffer here along the uh, relocated detention basin and then a buffer along this property line here. Some ornamental plantings at the entrance and then street tree plantings at least 40 feet on center, minimum of at least two per lot, all along Blueberry uh, Drive, down uh, Fernwood and then up Red Oak Drive. Uh, the proposal In your pack, it was a uh, 11 by 17 fold out. This is a slight enlargement of that. The proposal for the buffering is based on, uh, as, a, as a resident of Cape Elizabeth and one who lives in a, in a subdivision with similar size houses and, and uh, similar situations of both uh, enclosed yards and open yards, uh, I, I took that as a reference. Um, I also noted where the, the major trees were and those were marked, not all of them, but many of them were marked on the uh, plan that was submitted. Uh, we don't have any control over what happens with the contractors that are building the houses and we felt that uh, best to assume that the trees would not be there. I think it's unrealistic to make a proposal to the abutters saying that all the trees will be preserved and then have them either find through windfall, wind throw or uh, through clearing or, or um, utility construction that those trees are no longer uh, going to be uh, surviving. We did make one major change to the earlier proposal and that was that we eliminated the, the drainage, subsurface drainage behind the lots and created drainage between the lots that uh, David Camilla will uh, get into in more detail. What we tried to de depict in, in, in this uh, sketch was um, there are two lots, 82 and 83 existing houses. That's pretty much the massing that you see in the photos. We haven't uh, measured the, the buildings, but using the site survey and the, and the photos and counting clapboards and so forth, 
And then we took two uh, standard uh, house designs that Mr. Fistarchi provided, set them within the building envelope, and then drew in along this property line a six foot high stockade fence, and then a single row of staggered evergreen trees, and then uh, also show the street trees. All of the other landscaping other than the turf, which is typical to anything, is subject to the owner's discretion. But it's very typical of, of landscaping that you'll find in most subdivisions in Cape Elizabeth. I think the thing that's really important to note here is that we have houses backing up to houses. And as you know, many of the lots now are, have exceeded their property lines and have cleared beyond their property lines, essentially having eliminated some of the buffer that may have been possible to use. This is Brentwood neighborhood, which is just down the hill here. These lots are 10,000 square feet and smaller. And I wanted to show you, uh, here's two parallel uh, streets. Here's houses backed up back to back. This is a photograph of one lot, which I know quite well that shows a six foot high fence and it shows uh, hemlock trees that were about six feet tall when the individual that I know moved in there about uh, 17 years ago. Those trees are now quite mature, including some spruce trees located on the north edge. I thought what was interesting about this photograph is that my neighbor, or the person I know's neighbor, elected to remove the fence uh, several months ago and with great concern, but uh, with, a, with the vegetation having matured, it's actually very pleasant uh, under st overstory and understory experience. So it works both with the fence and without the fence. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're suggesting both, both possibilities. But this has perennial gardens. It has uh, typical um, broadleaf flowering shrubs and so forth that get installed over time. Um, We uh, looked at not only along the northwesterly property line, but the question was raised by the town engineer, if we're buffering there, do we need to buffer along those called the northeasterly line? Uh, and we took photographs. This is the uh, Charlotte Street area here, and uh, the Sawyer's house from two directions and the fog uh, parcel from one direction. A photograph at the end of uh, Charlotte Road where there's a low point that's actually beyond the uh, catch basin. And then just generally took some uh, photos here to show where the low points are, which are well beyond the existing property lines of the South Portland uh, butters. Uh, there's a lot of vegetation here, both volunteer and probably some older material, that uh, this is a side yard condition along Charlotte Road, whereas in the more typical condition along the Northwesterly property line, it's a backyard to backyard condition. So what we're proposing uh, is to endeavor to save existing trees as much as possible, but we know the implications of putting a tree preservation easement on this. The town takes it very seriously, and if we don't know we can save them, then we're not going to say we can. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can. I'm hopeful that we won't clear beyond the building envelope, uh, except for necessary for the side yard uh, swales. And Mr. Fistacci has some photographs from another construction site that indicates some of the success he's had in creating swales and being able to protect existing trees. But given the open nature of some of these back lots, uh, a fence is more than certainly is there now. There's a variety of vegetation that will uh, grow in over time. So uh, the uh, proposal we're suggesting is, has been provided in the packet. This is a partial uh, view of uh, Blueberry Road. Uh, and again, here's a close-up showing the, the staggered evergreen plantings. Um, they're offset rows, but they're in a, in a typically a straight line. And here's a section of fence. The interesting thing about, regardless of what we do for buffering, is that our lots don't line up. In other words, if this lot owner in Cape Elizabeth elects to put in a fence, 
he's only going to partially, or she is only going to partially screen lot 84 and lot 85. So it's really up to each lot owner's discretion as to whether they're going to use a vegetation or a fence or a combination of both. My sense is, knowing the market that, that uh, is, will be purchasing these houses, I would anticipate that many of the homeowners would, have, would opt to, to do both. Uh, this is a partial plan showing the offset trees. And here's an elevation. Here's a six-foot high fence. And the trees would be planted at about five to six-foot height, which is uh, just a little taller than I am. Um, and the advantage of that height is it's short enough that the tree will, will take off and grow rapidly. Uh, if you get into larger trees, they have a more effective screening initially, but they're not as quick to uh, mature over the next five to ten years. And this is, uh, the fence is all detailed on here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Henry. <clears throat> yeah, um, explain to me the notion of the buffer being chosen by each uh, homeowner. Does well, well, that create a, a possibility to create an inconsistency regarding what the back plot lines are going to look like? What I, what I would anticipate is the homeowners would have, they would have a very limited uh, selection. They would have a fence that would be predetermined and then they would have a choice of probably three trees. Uh, and to be used in combination, not just planted individually. Um, and that would be, so there's really only two choices at that point. If they want to do more than that, that's certainly up to them, but that's, that's the uh, two choices that we envisioned. One of the issues here is that this is a 20-foot buffer, and if you plant anything much more than that in an offset situation, there just isn't enough room there, plus in dealing with the uh, building envelope and not going out into the abutter's uh, property. I mean, the ideal situation here in an in a unrealistic world is that the South Portland abutters and the purchases of the house lots would, would uh, meet and talk and come up with a community planting plan and they would share the uh, responsibility of the buffering. Some of the buffering would go on to their side of the lot and some would be on our side, but that's certainly, we don't anticipate that, that world uh, ever existing so that what we're proposing is to put the uh, double row of trees or the staggered row of trees within our side of the property, try to preserve trees as much as possible, and to use a, a fence, which is the most uh, immediate for, form of buffer. And one that's found typically in most of the neighborhoods I go through in Cape Elizabeth, um, a six foot high stockade or wood, vertical wood uh, board fence is very typical. But, but some homeowners may elect just trees, some may elect just a fence, some may elect both. Both, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> continuing with that, um, and then I have another question. <clears throat> Is there going to be a minimum amount that they will have to elect? A minimum what? A minimum amount. Yes, that's correct. We're there will be. That would be five foot uh, feet in height, and that they would be spaced ten feet on center in a staggered row that has an eight foot offset. The other question I have is, you talked about the um, the lots, you showed us pictures of the lots on the northeasterly side and said you weren't planning on buffering those. Um, wouldn't it look more consistent if there was buffering in every adjacent lot? Uh, I, I, it would be foolish for me not to say that it would be more consistent because nothing would be more consistent than to have every lot buffered uh, the same. That was not an issue uh, when we, the, the issue we were dealing with was this line. And I think the, the difference on the northeasterly side, if you will, was the fact that those were side lot lines. I think actually the, the, the more of an issue in terms of impacts would be for the future lot purchases here because they're, they're going to be looking into what's called the service side of the service yard of the house. As an example, If I purchased uh, lot 11 in my house, where the house were at that end, so the northerly end of the lot, 
I would be looking into a shed that's very close to the lot line. There's a camper park there, and the, and the driveway is very close. So I think it's as much, I, I think the issue is really who needs to be buffered from what. And I think it would be certainly in the best interest of the home buyer to have a fence and whatever landscaping uh, to enhance that backyard. And what about the southerly lots? Is that situation the same as the easterly ones? Which lots? The ones on the south, uh, uh, on lots six and seven. Six and seven on the bottom. Down here? Not that one. That's not one of them. Nope. Put your finger back down on the bottom. Yes. Those, down here. Those two. Uh, at, the I, end, at the end of the road. There's a lot here and a lot here. This is the end of... Uh, no. The two you had your fingers on before. Right in here. It's lot number six and seven. They appear to abut. I don't know whether there's anything behind them or not. I think that area is wooded. We haven't looked at that for buffering, but if, that if, I, if I could add a again, comment, that would be a side yard situation. I just walked the I walked the uh, proposed subdivision this afternoon. The houses that abut those two lots are uh, situated pretty far back from the property line, so the the issue of houses close together isn't nearly as as uh, you know much of a point of discussion there as it is on the other sides of the of the proposed subdivision. Thank you. Thank you. And to the extent you're looking for feedback now on the, the buffering issue with respect to lots 11, 12, and 13, I, just based on my recollection of the site walk and the proximity of the abutters, it seems to me there is a, as equal a need for buffering there as there is for the, the, the area that you've already addressed in your plan. Thank you. And I'd, I'd uh, echo Mr. Sherman's comment. I think uh, based on on the, what I saw out there, it seems to me there's really a need for buffering along the entire northerly edge extending all the way to Mitchell Road. Uh, there's a section of oh. Blueberry Road that um, on the uh, Mitchell Road. Oh, I'm sorry, over here. Yes, sir. All the um, way down there. Although there's, there are not houses to be built there, uh, there are butters there, and, and when uh, anybody comes in off of Mitchell Road onto Blueberry Road, um, the road right away is pretty close to those backyards as well. And for consistency and, and uh, you know, the aesthetic appearance of the whole development, I would think you'd want to go all the way out there. Uh, do you have a preference for a landscaping versus a fence line? I, I guess the concern I have is that we're, we're almost into a gated community at that point. I think a soft, a softer version of some landscaping would be appropriate, but if we were to just start with a fence line here and just run it all the way up and around, uh, or at least in this part, I think probably vegetation would be preferable to, to just a solid fence. It would also tend to improve with age rather than yes. the reverse. Uh, one other question, and then I'll, I'll yield Mr. Seraldo. I guess in the past it's always been the responsibility of the applicant to provide the buffering or there was some kind of a third party financial arrangement. So could either of you comment on what you're proposing in this case since it sounds like it's it's going to be a, a staggered installation of buffering as, as lots are developed. Let me just talk, speak to the mechanical end, then I'll let, let the developer talk about the financial and legal end. The, I think the mechanical end is that if, if you come in here and the town somehow has control over this buffer, I mean, they will through the site plan and subdivision process, but if this is done all at once by the developer, then that means that the developer or somebody has to go in and make sure each one of those lot owners then is maintaining it correctly. If it's very clear to the lot owner when they move in, they own that. It's part of their purchase. Um, the first thing they do is they have to put up a fence and or put up um, the trees that we've described. I think that in the long, long range approach is, a, is an easier way of dealing with it. Um, I've recently had an involvement in a, in a buffer discussion over in Falmouth on a very sensitive project, not as a designer, but as a peer reviewer. And um, that was, the issue was that all of the land on the other side was all publicly owned, so it was a slightly different issue, but it became um, very challenging to think about how this thing would be maintained over, over the long run. Uh, and this would be done by each individual lot owner. I would imagine there'd be caveats set up and uh, that responsibility would ride with the deeds, but I'll leave that up to the applicant. Continuing to answer that question, we thought about how we were going to do this. And if we went right in and got the, the fence up or the buffering in before the excavating and taking down about the trees, 
One, it may be damaged. Two, uh, there might be some inconsistencies in the in the buffering itself. So we felt that as the lots were developed, the fencing buffering would be put in place. We've got no no problems with that being part of a certificate of occupancy inspection, that the buffering is in place according to the plans that you people approve. But we felt that because um, if we did the developing of the lot, that it may be some uh, some harm done to what we put in place maybe two or three, five years before. As Tom mentioned, we have a concern with what's in place now. So if we were to add to what's in place now, right, that will add to the concern of, of uh, saving the trees. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Should we move into the drainage issue? Yeah, uh, uh, I have another question to Mr. Emery. The evergreens that you're proposing, what's the growth rate on that? They grow uh, about a foot. Let me, let me calculate this quickly. Uh, the evergreens behind my house have, they were about six feet tall when we moved in. It's been about 15 years and they've tripled in height. They're 18 to 24 feet high. Um, so if you do the division, but it's about one to two feet every five years, and then it and, and then it uh, goes on. They also have a tendency to fill out as they uh, they get a little denser at the top. The ones we're selecting are spruce and hemlock, some pine, but not a lot of pine, just for variety, uh, and probably some fir, and that'll provide a good variety of form, uh, density, and uh, It'll look much more naturalized. We don't want to see just a, a row of pine tree in there because they tend to drop their lower branches and needles. So how, assuming there's only trees as opposed to a fence, how long would it be before there's a consistent screen between the... There'll be a consistent screen immediately. There'll be a screen of, of trees planted 10 feet on center that are six feet high. And they'll have a... Uh, the bottoms will be about six to eight feet, six feet typically if they're good full trees. So there'll be a little gap between them, but they'll be staggered slightly, so that gap will be minimized when you're looking uh, head on at the. So there'll be an immediate row, double, a staggered row of trees six feet high. That'll be immediate effect. I would say within five years that would be fully filled in, and then it would probably be about two to three feet taller than that. And in ten years it would be probably time when people would be doing some pruning. This is, it's a very challenging issue because uh, this, these lots are on the south side of a boundary line. I would imagine there are butters here who have gardens who may not want to have a, a double row or a staggered row of evergreens shading their, their, their backyard areas. Um, I don't know, maybe they do, but um, I think you know, given those two choices, a six foot tall fence, or I found in my own experience with my yard facing west or the person I know's yard facing west, that uh, it's already, it's now overshaded. The west light has been lost for much of the late afternoon, and that's after 12, 15 years. Sounds like a long time, but it's, it's, an, it's a blink of the eye in terms of what it feels like. Any other questions? Should we get into the drainage issue? David Camilla, and I'm a civil engineer with Land Use Consultants. Um, we were asked by Mr. Fustashi to um, take a look at the plans and the, uh, the drainage uh, um, system that was designed by Mr. Manthorne and um, come up with a, a, a revised plan that um, satisfied the issues that were brought up by the town's engineer, uh, Mr. Harding and those associates. And um, what we've come up with is um, uh, 
probably best uh, represented by uh, sheet four of seven in the plan set. If you uh, if you uh, take a look at that plan, what uh, what what we have done is essentially captured the uh, the the majority of the the roadways and and the lot lots within this proposed project within what we refer to as watershed A and uh, it is all being collected by a system of catch basins, storm drains and um, inlets which in the case of all of the lots on the north side of Blueberry Road where uh, Tom has been discussing all of the buffering we have provided individual um, inlets at the common lot lines between lots 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, and 13. Um, the previous plan that Mr. Manthorne had proposed had a storm drain system consisting of uh, under drains and catch basins along the back lot line connecting out to the storm drain in Blueberry Road. Um, when we got into the discussions about this, because of the fact that we wanted to provide buffering in the back here, we didn't feel it made sense to also put a storm drain there because uh, potential conflicts between the two in terms of ongoing maintenance and so forth. And uh, so we came up with the idea of just individual inlets, which are essentially like a culvert at the street with a, um, a graded swale on, on all of the individual lot lines so that when the houses are built and the lots are graded, all the stormwater will be directed into these swales and then it will enter the storm drain system. Um, all the stormwater eventually is directed into a detention basin, which is um, different than the one that was proposed on the, uh, the previous plan. It was kind of an L shape in the previous plan. It came up here along the, uh, the edge of Blueberry Road. We have now concentrated the stormwater detention here in the rear of the, uh, the lot that's, that's owned by uh, Flacatulis. Um, this is uh, a very simple design. It's an excavated basin, um, seven or eight feet deep. It is not a berm type situation. Um, the, uh, the pond is essentially constructed in the ground. The stormwater will enter here through this discharge pipe from the uh, Blueberry Road um, system, as well as a certain amount of stormwater will just flow naturally through this wooded portion here and into the basin. It has an outlet structure with multiple outlets that uh, will control the, the two, the 25 and the 100 year storms. Um, it will then discharge through a pipe system which uh, consists of an 18 inch pipe which will run all the way to Mitchell Road and then we are going to replace some existing um, 12 inch culverts that are in Mitchell Road now with a, with a new system of catch basins and uh, manholes which will ultimately connect the existing cross culp located here. Um, there are two other areas of the site which are labeled Watershed B, which is this one here um, at the end of uh, Charlotte Road, and then a second watershed labeled C here, um, which is at the end of our Red Oak Drive. I can't remember the name of the street here in South Portland. But in both of these cases, the, uh, the watershed area that uh, drained in these two directions before in the, in the existing condition was much larger. We're reducing the area of both of those watersheds. We are, however, increasing the amount of impervious surface due to um, some home construction. In the case of watershed B, the, uh, the net effect is that it is, is a reduction in terms of the amount of flow. In watershed C, it's a very slight increase. And um, one of the comments of Mr. Uh, um, Harding in his, his review comments that we received recently he asked if we could take another look at Watershed C and see if we could reduce that some more, and I think we can. We're going to try to do something in this area here with lots six and seven in terms of uh, some fine tuning of the grading so that uh, we will be directing less water in this direction, which flows off site behind the, uh, the dwellings here in South Portland. So that the, the net effect of what we're proposing is that there will be no increase in the, uh, the peak flows for, uh, for any of the design storms. And the, the majority of the site will be directed to the detention basin, and uh, then it will flow into the, uh, the system of Mitchell Road. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, at that point I'll stop and uh, just, just, you know, answer questions of the board if I could. Thank you. Mr. 
Chum. Sir, the, uh, the detention basin is adjacent to and slightly overlapping the RP2 wetland? Down there in that corner? Yeah, there's a very, very minor, um, right here, there's some, there's some slight intrusion in terms of grading. Um, we're talking a very, very minor, uh, a few hundred square feet. So if, if I were a resident in this area and I went by that detention basin every day in an average year, how often would I see standing water or, or uh, wet conditions down there? Well, I mean, the base of the detention basin will, will probably look very much like a wetland. Um, you know, it'll be saturated and uh, there'll probably be some wetland vegetation there. But as far as standing water, um, in terms of more than a foot deep, um, only during design storms. Um, for a very short period of time, um, you know, a two-year storm um, or a, a ten-year storm, 25-year storm, the pond will fill up during the, the, the storm when it's at its most intense, and it should be within 24 to 48 hours completely dry. Um, other than there'll be, you know, puddles on the on the bottom of the pond, those those are pretty much unavoidable. But uh, so it would be kind of like an extension of the of the RP2 zone that we've created by by putting that. Yeah, I suppose basically. you might say that. I mean, it's not intended to be a wetland. No, I'm just I'm just trying to characterize what it would yeah. be like. Yeah, because it, it it will not it will not look like a lot of detention bases where you have a berm around them. When you were if you were standing here, for example, looking in this direction, you probably wouldn't really see the pond because the pond is a depression. It's a hole in the ground as opposed to being something you know with a dike around. Mm -hmm. it. So it will you know it'll look like uh, you know sort of a free form depression. We we we've, we've tried to design this with a little bit of curvature to it, so it's not a a rectangular, um, you know, engineer looking structure. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions I'd like to... As far as the... Just take the uh, drainage uh, section here between lot 19 and 18. Um, that drainage area at the end is that a screened entrance to a culvert? Is that what that's depicted as? Um, you're referring to this, this dashed line? At, at the end, close to the street, this, uh, on my plan here, it shows it looks like a screen on top of an opening, or is that just uh, showing a, a gravel area? That oh, I think th that's intended to show th there's, there's like a riprap entrance okay. that's um, you know, done for erosion control purposes. That's, a, that's just a symbolic, um, you know. Historically, I've seen those begin to catch debris and whatnot. Is that the landowner's responsibility to keep that clean? Is that typically what the way it's assumed it will be taken care of? Normally, yes. I mean, these are going to, they don't show it here, but one of the comments of the town's engineer is that he wanted us to provide easements over these um, existing uh, inlets. And uh, we haven't actually, you know, worked out the details, but uh, presumably there will be some sort of a, um, a public, you know, uh, easement that will go with the road over each each and every one of these so the town maintenance crew could in fact go in there and clear a culvert like they do now but it, normally the homeowners are the ones who are um, most aware of these things so I mean they would be likely the ones that would clear an obstruction um, on that on that same drawing uh, four of seven shows on a line which I think indicates on the northerly side indicates that the, the natural flow of water is a black line. I think you have it on your drawing there. Is that the way it presently exists? So that I would assume that on the lots of those existing homes in South Portland that the sheet flow is towards Cape Elizabeth. Is that typical? Yes. Is that what that you're is, depicting there? This is based on field observation. It's relatively flat if you've been out there and looked at this. Um, you know, the, the, the actual contours stop at the property line, but um, my project engineer went out here and, you know, walked along all the backyards, and as best he could determine, that seemed to be an appropriate break line. I think that, if anything, we erred on the side of caution and included perhaps more area than may, may really drain there, just to be on the safe side. But um, in general, we've included all of the backyards of all of these lots. So I would assume that when these lots are graded, that the intention would be to try to grade it so that 
that there would, there would be no flow from these lots on to South Portland, but they would uh, lean towards the drainage on in between each lot? Yes. Okay. All, all of the proposed lots will be graded so that they will flow into our system. Um, and hopefully, there are some standing, you know, um, pockets here along the back line that, that you know, when it's, when it's raining or, or in the springtime, the water just sits there. So when we do fine grade these lots, it's hoped that a lot of that can be incorporated into these and uh, drained off. Um, if, it's, if, it, if it's too far onto the abutting lot, we, we, we won't be crossing the lot line to do grading unless, you know, the neighbor, you know, works with us on that. But um, to the extent that we can, we will drain those backyards. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to answer one of your earlier questions, uh, Dave. You asked about a grate on the culvert yes. on the lots. I asked the engineer to place something over the pipe. It was a 12-inch 12, 12 pipe. And maybe we're uh, using an ounce of prevention here. My concern was toddle as someone of animals going into these grates and uh, taking up residence if it was an animal or someone that would have difficulty coming out. And your, your, your concern probably is well taken that there may be some leaves or something else that might be locking it up. But I'd, I'd much rather have something preventing animals or, or children from going inside. I, I would also hope that you work that easement detail out so that uh, somebody can be responsible for keeping it clean if it gets, gets clogged. Um, well, if it's on, on the Cape Elizabeth uh, in the right of way, then the easement would, is there in place. Uh, but I think that the public works would say that it would be left up to the individual homeowners to, to maintain it. And I really don't expect an awful lot of, uh, of debris, leaves, or whatever being, being in there. I think it would be in the homeowner's interest to keep it clear or they'll have a pond in their front yard. <laughs> I would think so. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask a question, please. Um, you've done your analysis based on a 25-year storm threshold, and I recall, and I, this is probably a question for Maureen, in past we've requested 100-year storm analysis. Is that an ordinance requirement, or do we request it in certain circumstances? Normally, I'd love to answer this question, but I'm going to defer to the town engineer. <laughs> <laughs> While he is coming to the podium, however, I will share that we have discussed the need to design for larger storms. Um, it's really a balancing act because once you start, you, you certainly don't want a flooding situation. But uh, the other side is, do you want to design a culvert that is so large and aesthetically so disruptive that will only handle a storm that's going to happen once every 500 years? So there is, there is some balancing that the engineer has to do with that. Thank you. I'm Steve Harding. I'm from Moses Associates. I'm the town engineer. Um, Maureen's correct. There is, in the ordinances, a 25-year storm okay. threshold. Um, none of the subdivisions that I've worked on personally have required a 100-year storm threshold. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, I do believe that they did an analysis which basically proved that the wetland area in that kind of a situation would act as kind of an overflow device so that the uh, wetland area would back up, the stormwater would back up in that area and then dissipate in the storm society. In Thank this you. case, I think they've taken that into account. And my question was to what does the ordinance require, so you've answered that satisfactorily. Thank you. While you're... Okay. Steve? Steve? We may have a couple other questions for you, but while you're up here, we might as well... Yeah, one of your <clears throat> notes was the uh, cul-de-sac at the end regarding uh, the dimensions, uh, increasing the size of it rather than... Yeah, I think for the most part it's, it's pretty good. The only thing is this return radius is 80 feet and the ordinance requires a 100-foot radius. So what we've done is ask the designer to come back and, and provide that flatter curve. And I think he can do that. It, the only problem will be it, it won't be parallel to the right-of-way line, which is typical of what you would try to design. I haven't talked directly with that designer, but I'm sure he can accomplish so, that. So my only concern was the cul-de-sac, as it's dimensioned presently, is adequate except for the entrance to it? Just, just the return radius as you come back out and around. Um, and that's primarily for snow plowing. I don't Thank you. Notice it in the While Steve's up there, do you have any other questions? Uh, 
Well, of someone, uh, <laughs> a, a wetlands question. Steve, maybe you know the answer. And I, perhaps uh, we went over this earlier. And I apologize if I've forgotten. But what what wetlands information are we relying upon, and when was it uh, gathered? Do you know? Um, you know more. If you don't mind. That's fine. Um, the wetlands information, and I hope Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when the original subdivision was done, I think it was 92, 93, um, most of the wetlands information that, that we have here is from that date. However, there has been some supplemental information, I think specifically the, um, the access to Mitchell Road is not owned by the applicant at that time, and he has since gone out there and added that information to the plans, which he would not have had in 92 because he didn't own the property. The access to Mitchell Road? That, that last lot that he just bought that now creates that access to Mitchell Road up right. there. There are no wetlands shown on the property. That's right, no, they, they, but it was analyzed to make sure that there weren't any wetlands there. In July of this year, of last year, 2001, uh, Richard Sweet Associates went out and re-flagged this area and this area in here. So it is up to date. It's we first started this application. So what's shown on this plan in terms of wetland delineation was done in 2001? That's correct, yes. And that was done, the first one was done by um, Albert Frick, and that was mostly done on the Rosewood portion of the subdivision. The rest of it was reviewed and uh, information was submitted to us in July by Richard Sweeney. So it is up, it's up to date as I think that could be expected. Mr. Sachi, while you're up there, maybe you could answer a question for me. Uh, I'm trying to understand how residents get access to the open space. And as I think I was, was just clarified for me, that the only way to get there is to, is to walk through the wetland or the wet area of the detention basin off of Blueberry Road. Uh, there are areas that you can walk that are not wetlands. And Tom, um, have we ever designed to put footbridge or anything? Uh, we're Based on the concerns of, of the review committee, uh, we're planning a, a footbridge uh, over the wetlands. And these wetlands, if you've walked it, you'll see that probably it's, it's wet in May and June, or the first part of June, and then the rest of the year uh, it really is dry. There's not a lot of water there. And I think one of the reasons is uh, the water typically is to drain through through this property here. There's a little man-made stream, actually, or ditch, and the water it's very, very small, and it comes down here, basically trickles down. And certainly, if that was open, uh, this water would, would really drain out a lot, a lot quicker in the in the uh, in the spring. So. It may be wetlands or identified as wetlands. The characteristics are that it is wetlands. But in reality, it's dry land except for two months of the year. And we are proposing a, a footbridge to come from the, the open area back to this area here. And this is the important area. Over here, there's not much to, uh, uh, to visit. So this would be the, the more interesting land here, the ridges, the uh, access to the pond. So presumably there will be on a, on the a future uh, submission of your plans would be specifics about the type of bridge and construction and location. And, and yeah, we'll have that available at the next meeting. Uh, I think we just received the uh, the comments uh, well, last week. I uh, can't remember when I received them, but, but we haven't had time to work on them. But we will have something available. But uh, this hopefully will give you greater access to the to the open space. Right. Okay, and, and along the same lines, uh, the the drawing depicts the the building envelopes for lots one and two are uh, pretty much right up against the boundary of the RP2 wetland, and I believe the conservation commission has has suggested, if not requested, that you consider not building on those lots 
and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that subject. Well, certainly not uh, something that excited me. Uh, to, eliminate, to eliminate 10 percent of the lots uh, in a subdivision is quite extensive. Um, the, uh, <coughs> these lots are very functional. I don't believe the small area of wetlands that, that they're impacting uh, is significant. Um, and I think that there's, there's certainly ample access to the open space. And I'm giving you 62% of, of the open space, too. So that's quite a bit. Uh, you're only asking for 40%. <laughs> Mr. Fristacci, is there anything that you might be willing to add to the plan to kind of prevent uh, lawn creep or uh, with lots one and two. I mean, it seems to me that once those folks have moved in, there's a good chance they could gradually push out their uh, lawns and landscaping into the, further into the wetlands. John Dory from the South Portland um, Land Trust suggested that we leave as many of these lots natural as we possibly can. Good suggestion. Uh, leaving them natural. I don't think lawns will grow in the in the uh, this area of wetlands. I mean, there's no vegetation there now except leaves, and uh, and there's nothing growing. I mean, there's no vegetation, so I don't think that you'll see anything. So keeping in this natural state would be a good idea, and this certainly would be encouraged uh, by the by the homeowners. Uh, anything I can add? Uh, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, and I'm no expert. I, I don't know if folks I, the I really, commission could. That's why I have these two individuals with me this evening. But I, I think that uh, we will try to keep them in the natural state uh, as much as possible in that back area so you don't have the lawn creep or anything else creeping back. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, there is an affordable housing requirement and I did not notice that the lots were specified for affordable housing. I haven't done it as yet. Uh, I haven't been uh, uh, told that I needed to do it at this particular time. Certainly, I have to do it at this particular time tonight. No. <laughs> uh, but that will be done real soon. Uh, my suggestion or my proposal is to make several of these lots available for uh, the affordable housing provision in these two lots certainly uh, are candidates for being uh, nominated as, as a uh, affordable housing lot and looking at uh, ways to ensure that the homes remain affordable wherever uh, smaller lots with limited opportunities to expand are excellent lots to assure that homes will remain affordable forever. And this, these two lots, are, as I said, probably will be uh, candidates for that, along with several others. Well, it's my understanding. I believe you have to put that in the deed. Is that not correct, Maureen? Yes. That they That's remain correct. affordable housing. And you're planning on the um, affordable housing for moderate income? Yes, yes. Thank I you. think we'll be looking at, at a minimum of two. Yes. I have a couple of new questions. Um, in our memo with the applicant's materials this time, um, there was a comment that the applicant should submit a revised calculation of total area and open space to be donated. Is this the revised calculation that we got in our packet? As far as I'm aware, it is not. Okay, and why was that concern raised? Um, well, what in your opinion needs to be revised? I, I still believe that uh, there needs to be some clear black and white calculation in the file so a year from now if we need to pull something out and make sure that everything was complied with that it's in there um, since the applicant has come forward a lot has been carved off for his home another lot has been added and a third lot has now been deeded to the town so there have been some calculation changes so I just want a, a the final up-to-date total area of the parcel and I know you, you read them off tonight, but it would be nice if, it, if we, it could be submitted in the package next month. What I read off tonight was on the plan that's before you that was submitted. That is a blow up of what was on the plan that's before you. Um, if that's not adequate, then I will provide what is necessary. But that is what the, the engineer, uh, Richard Manthorne, 
is calculated after all the deductions and the adjustments for this and that. But we will again provide whatever, whatever the, the town wants, whatever the planning board wants. I don't have it in front of me, but I remember when I looked at it, it wasn't obvious that you were meeting the open space calculation. It, it should be calculated the way the ordinance requires it, where you have the total gross area, subtract out your roads, easements, everything else, to get to what you have. Um, my conversation with the town planner was that we will review this and, and make sure that this is adequate. If it's not, then we will, we will make sure that it is adequate. Okay. Thank you. And my second question re is regarding the edge of Edgewood Road. Um, at our last meeting, we discussed it at some length. Um, we directed Maureen to contact the abutters and see if we could get some direction from them as to what they wanted to do. We have since heard from both the abutters in writing. Um, seems to clear to me that based on their comments, um, one of them said if push came to shove, um, he would be happy to use Red Oak Drive, I believe, rather than Edgewood Road. Um, but both of them were lukewarm to the idea, so I wanted to reopen this issue. My understanding is the last 25 feet has been vacated by the town of South Portland. Does that, that means they provide no town services to that. Is that correct? The legal standing is that it is it is not uh, no longer a public road. I don't think we want to, but let's put it this way. The city of South Portland is still plowing it. <laughs> Um, I guess I just wanted to offer my opinion on the subject um, since neither of the abutters seems to have a burning desire to want to exit via Red Oak rather than Edgewood. Um, and I don't see any reason to press to make it a throughway. Um, I just wanted to offer that comment. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Any discussion that you want to at this point, or is this going to open up on a <coughs> subject that we had a hard time dealing with last time? It, it's hard for me to, you know, speak on. I uh, I spent one year fighting South Portland, uh, and we're in the courts, so I'm still fighting. Uh, my feelings, my desire, obviously, is to, to have it open and, and to go through uh, as an open open street. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, and, and one feeling that I have is anytime you have a vehicle backing up, whether it be an oil truck, or an automobile, a van, or whatever, it's very difficult to see what's behind you. And you're just, you know, it's an accident waiting for a place to happen. So I feel very strongly about the streets going through. But I mean, I'm, I'll do what you want me to do. We've designed this to uh, access uh, the end of, of Edgewood Road. We have a cul-de-sac there. If you do terminate it at the at the edge of uh, Edgewood Road, there is a, a, um, a cul-de-sac. Excuse me, a turnaround. A, a, um, a turnaround, which was built according to town specifications, and it's it's serviceable. It's paid. It's uh, it's available if you do want to dead in the street. So, you know, it's it's not my call, quite honestly. The ball's not in my court on this one. Yes, so Portland made any ovations to you or anybody else that you might know that they would close that off? They've already closed it off. They've closed and, off. But they still oh, plow it and, and they still, yes, they and the two people presently use that as e egress to their property um, with beaded rights to them, I guess. Well, it's awful difficult for me to respond to that. Okay. I mean, I, so presently, as we see the plan that you show right now, it ends at the beginning of the, or the last lot on the left-hand side, and those residents would have a choice to either use your method of getting onto Red Oak, or they choose to go to South Portland, but it wouldn't be illegal right away, through okay. Lake. Okay. Well, the two residents right now, uh, Bolas and, and uh, the Brown House, 
uh, if this were to be completed, the subdivision, they would have the option right now to go to legally. The other residents wouldn't have that option legally. But, you know, the road is there, there's no fence up, and no, no one's checking IDs. Um, but I doubt, and, and William Bray has also stated that he doubts that there's going to be a lot of through traffic of, you know, if, if there is through traffic, it's going to be extremely minimal. Okay, thank you. Do you have a motion? I have a couple other questions from Sachi, if I may. Sorry, Joe. A couple more. Uh, sidewalks. If, am I understanding right that your current proposal is to have a sidewalk on one side of the street, not both, but would it indeed continue from Mitchell Road all the way around to the Edgewood Road connection, or would there be any breaks in that sidewalk? Uh, let's see. Currently, we have sidewalks on one side, and we have it coming up to Red Oak Drive on this lot right here, and then, and then stopping. Right. Curving would be on both sides and around the cul-de-sac itself, the center of the cul-de-sac. So, yes, uh, well, actually, no, there would not be any breaks. We'd terminate it here pick it up along here and this plan doesn't show it but it would come up to this lot here inside of this lot here and then the driveway and the other lot that's it why would it not go around the cul-de-sac uh you have driveways it's narrow and we feel as though that people normally don't walk in the uh, on cul-de-sac sidewalks really Maybe it's hard for me to visualize, but it seems like a broken up sidewalk wouldn't be nearly as visually appealing as one that, that would take you through the entire development. So somebody who came, who was walking from Mitchell Road on the sidewalk would get to the cul-de-sac and then well, what would they cross into the street and then back onto the sidewalk on the other side? Or? Are they walking, just walking in the neighborhood? and? Just walking on the sidewalks, or are they going to a specific house? A mother with a, a father with a stroller out for a walk. A political <laughs> way. <laughs> I'm just relaying what Mr. Manthorn told me, <laughs> and it made sense when he told it to me. Um, however, if this board wants sidewalks 100% around the cul de sac, we'll install them 100% around the cul de sac. But keep in mind that they are going to be broken up because of the driveways. These are, are narrow lots, and uh, you're going to be having uh, driveway uh, aprons. For what it's worth, it uh, seemed to me to make sense to have the sidewalk in before the cul-de-sac. I think if you were walking through the neighborhood, you'd, you'd probably just cross the street and continue on the sidewalk coming down Fernwood Lane. Yeah. I'm not a sidewalk expert, but that's fine. Thing. Well, let's look at the, the I, next version of the submission and maybe it'll be easier I, to judge. You had another question? You uh, just uh, comment, if you would, the, the uh, process of reviewing this would be much simpler for all concerned, I think, if you could combine your drawing package into one. Because I was a little confused in going through the, the review note from the town engineer and other folks whether I needed the uh, land use consultants package or the, the other package. So if you could, on the next go around, make that a consolidated submission. Yes, we could, we'll, yes, we'll work on that. Thank you. Uh, I had a comment and also another question. You, you stated that, that you would put the walkway down Red Oak if we, should, if we wanted it. Is that what I understood you to say? Uh, well, I was talking in the cul-de-sac itself. We have the, the walk down. This plan only shows that it's two Red Oak Drive. Yes. Talking with uh, Mr. Manthorn, he said that it was down Red Oak Drive to the lot number 10. Okay. I, I think the way you have the walks presently shown here is adequate. Um, and the reason I say that is that the main thing you want to do is try to keep the people off the roadway as much as you can on the throughway area. But around a cul-de-sac, I think, and you get at the cul-de-sac, I'd go along with the way you've got it drawn here. I think it's uh, adequate, in my opinion. I 
have a motion. I have a motion for the board uh, to consider, uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Fustacci for major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for the 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road be tabled to the regular March 19, 2002 meeting of the planning board. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, I will tend it to vote. All those in favor of the motion in front of us, please show by raising their right hand. The motion carries. Second item on our agenda this evening is the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a site plan review to convert the building at 343 Ocean House Road to a community center. An existing structure including office space on the third floor, uh, check that on the first floor, and a dwelling unit on the second floor is also located on the site. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-6-4 town center zoning district design requirements. Would the applicant please, please uh, introduce the project? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Dennis Judd landscape architect with SMRT and with me tonight are also um, Patty Flynn another landscape architect from my office and Kyler Eagles the architect working on the project and Steve Harding whom you all know very well has helped us with the engineering of this project I can go through a brief presentation I can ask uh, if you'd rather deal with the issue of completeness first which would be the preference of the board? I think we'd like to deal with the completeness first. Okay. Sorry, maybe you didn't hear me. If we could deal with the completeness first, would be preference. Go ahead. The uh, items on the plan, town planners list. Uh, submitted with your memo uh, show everything in, in complete except that we're asking for a waiver from the storm regular storm uh, management report component and also that there's there seem to be some partial information uh, regarding signs which I think we can address tonight as well so it seems from from our perspective with the, the, um, <coughs> the dealing with the issue of the waiver that this could be deemed complete we can move forward tonight okay is there any questions uh, on the board's part regarding the completeness issue? If, uh, if there's information regarding the signage, I, I think we're all set. I certainly wouldn't disagree with the waiver on the stormwater. You, any other? You would not disagree with that? No. Any other thoughts? Okay. Hearing yes, no further discussion, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. 
Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application by the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review to convert the building located at 343 Ocean House Road to a community center be deemed complete. Motion's been made on completeness. Uh, is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, we show by raising right hand. The motion carries. We can carry on from here. Thank you very much. Um, you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with the location of this project and the situation of how we got here. But just very briefly, uh, we have Route 77, the IGA High School, um, the, the um, Junior High, uh, Pond Cove is just off the plan, and we have the Community Center building here, which is the old Pond Cove Millwork building with the existing uh, historic building on the front of the parcel fronting Route 77 currently has a residence upstairs and a um, in the works a professional office um, business for the first floor. The, the property is just over an acre uh, as you've seen in, in the submission materials. Uh, it's almost entirely developed at this point with buildings and uh, either uh, asphalt or gravel pavement. Um, the buildings are currently served by uh, water, sewer, electric, and cable TV individually, both from Route 77 and from the high school entrance drive. The uses on the site are all permitted to the town center, uh, the existing residents. The proposed office building, which is really not part of this submission, but we're dealing with it in, to a certain extent as existing conditions um, as part of our plan. Um, and of course, the municipal use for community services center. The, I'm just going to go very briefly through the floor plans. I'll, I'll just go through the program. You've seen the floor plans themselves. If we have some architectural questions, Kyla can certainly answer them for us. Uh, on the upper level is, is the primary, it's a two-story barn, and on the upper level is the primary developed or renovated space for the program that we're discussing here. Downstairs will be uh, used primarily for the mechanical services for the building, the boilers, some mechanical space, and for some um, undeveloped or unfinished storage. Upstairs will be event spaces, uh, meeting rooms, a kitchen, um, some extended care classrooms for uh, before and after school. The, uh, there are two small additions to the building. There's a proposed addition for the main entrance and vertical circulation for the building that's going to bring people in on the lower level, uh, down in here, and then the other addition, which is just a covered stairway uh, for egress from the upper level. The traffic report, uh, as you have read, indicates that there are, there's already an existing condition that, that um, has created a level of service uh, of F, which is the worst we can get, coming out of the high school for left-hand turns. Uh, we had the traffic looked at to uh, address whether we were going to be making anything better or worse and how we could minimize uh, any additional impacts and try to improve to the best extent we can what's going on uh, out in there. Uh, Patty's going to get into the details of the site design in a few minutes and the layout and circulation, but very briefly in terms of traffic, you know that there are currently two entrances off of Route 77, which will be terminated, closed off um, for this development. We'll be proposing a new um, two-way entrance into the site in the central portion and then a single exiting um, lane out the back end of the site. What this really does for us is allows the, the traffic to move in and out um, pretty much as it is today. Um, the level of service, as I said, is not good for the AM uh, peak hour, which is from 7 to 8, and it's a level E for the PM peak hour, which is 145 to 245, which pretty much coincides with the school. Um, uh, uses. Now, the, the afternoon program in this building will not coincide with that peak hour school-related um, 
afternoon um, uh, traffic movement, but in the AM it will. But the, the actual level of service won't change from what it is today to what it is or what it might be uh, at the end of this year. Um, there was a recommendation of the traffic engineer that related to all of this, uh, which is really out of the scope, unfortunately, of this project, but it will be addressed um, in the near future, reasonably near future, by the town and other, other funds and other projects. It will have to be done in association with DOT, but it is to provide a bypass lane on Route 77, which would allow cars to go past a car that might be waiting to turn left into the facility that allow a car legally to pass as they do today. Not quite legally, but there's, it's not unsafe. There's plenty of room. Just we'd have to make the papers to uh, allow that to occur. So again, it's an issue that it's no worse with this development. It's in the works for future uh, town projects in, in association with the DOT. So we're not addressing that on this uh, site plan or in the construction proposed for this, summer, this spring. Uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Patty, who will go through some of the details of the, of the uh, site design, and then I'll come back uh, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. In uh, designing the layout of the site, we explored a number of options in detail, whether to maintain one of the two exits from the front or not, whether to have two accesses into the site off of the high school access road or to have only one, whether to go out the back or not, whether to cut through the median um, as, as another way of exiting uh, uh, the site or not. And, uh, the plan that you see here is what we, the um, conclusion that we finally came to that would uh, address the need, needs of the community center in the best way, uh, respond to the requirements outlined in the ordinance, and provide the uh, safest and best circulation of traffic in and out of the site and, and um, through the site at, back out to Route 77. Um, we, we chose uh, and the way of getting into the site um, up here that's about, about 200 feet from Route 77, which excludes the recommendation from the traffic engineer that it be at least 150 feet from this intersection for safety and the least confusing uh, number and intersection of traffic movements. So uh, a vehicle would enter the site here and then the parking splits off into two areas, a front or upper area and a back or lower area that is connected by this piece here which serves to make up a change in grade of um, several feet from, from back to front. And the uh, a, a vehicle could exit the site out the back here. This would be a one-way exit, which would bring the, the traffic from the site back into the circulation pattern of the uh, high school. Um, car would have to go around the circle and then out this existing um, egress road. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have included walkways, which would connect the building entrances to the parking areas and to the existing walkway, existing walkway systems of the high school site. We have uh, added a walkway along Route 77 in accordance with the, um, the town center um, esplanade um, as outlined in the ordinance. Um, this would be a concrete walk with a uh, green um, a grass strip along Route 77 and a, and a concrete curb uh, and, and a walkway leading up to the front of the uh, house, the front building on the site and um, connecting out to a crosswalk over here connecting to this parking area in the back. Uh, we calculated the number of parking spaces for the site based on the employee count 
um, for the community center, based on, also based on the square footage of each different kind of use in this whole complex um, um, meeting, meeting and assembly space in the community center, office space in the existing house and the um, existing residence above the office space. And we came up with a total of 63 spaces for the site. Um, 40 of those would be required for the, uh, to meet the needs of the assembly and meeting space. 15 um, to accommodate the, no, the 12 employees that there would be for the community center. Six spaces for the professional office use up front and two spaces for the existing re uh, residents. And we have managed to accommodate uh, 42 of those spaces in this area of the site, which leaves, which leaves 21 spaces that still need to be accommodated. However, um, this, this parking lot to the rear that's currently used for bus parking, um, we, have been, we have been told by the uh, town manager that the buses will be moved to a new site. There are 12 buses that currently park there right now along the back row, and uh, 12, 12 spaces are used for the bus drivers' cars, and 26 spaces are left over currently for, the, uh, for student parking. So uh, if the buses and the bus drivers' parking spaces are removed from this lot and the, and the whole thing is restriped, we have calculated that we can uh, get 84 spaces in that in that area. So if you uh, subtract 21 spaces, which would be needed for the use of the community center, and 26 spaces, which are already currently used for student parking, that still leaves an ex a, a gain of 37 spaces that could be used for uh, school for the school uses in addition to. Um, be, what we need for the center and what's already being used. Um, planting. We, there are a number of existing trees around the, around the border of the site and we have laid out the site and designed the grading plan to preserve as many of those as possible. These are shown in the, the lighter green and then the, the darker green are the proposed plantings. Um, we're adding some trees to, to along the along the uh, road on the side and along the front to fill in the, the spaces there, um, and a, a row of shrubs to buffer the parking from the sidewalk Esplanade and Route and Route 77. Um, special attention to the the entry areas with uh, shrubs and ground covers. Um, grading, the, uh, the site will be, there won't be a lot of changes, a lot of drastic grading. There, as I said, there will be some grading up, up here to, to connect the two parking areas and um, make for a better, a better layout of, of parking um, on two levels. And we will be cutting through the existing berm at the, at the rear in order to connect out to the road. Um, otherwise, uh, the, the pattern of drainage will be virtually the same. Currently, there is a catch an existing catch basin down here at the lowest end of the site, and most of the site drains down to that. Um, that catch basin is, for various reasons, needs to be replaced. It's not in good condition. I don't think it uh, is, has enough capacity. Uh, I don't think it's working well right now, so we're looking at just uh, replacing that, um, adding three new catch basins, one here, one here, and one in here. So, so but the pattern of drainage would be the same. These would, these would uh, connect to each other and then feed out into the same system that serves the high school, which is basically what is happening now with the existing drainage system. The utilities will pretty much remain the same. There's an existing water line that that runs along here with a connection into the building about there. That will remain, remain the same. Uh, there is an existing sewer connection out the back, which 
should be adequate to our needs, but we, we are doing some more research into being absolutely sure of that. Um, and if it proves that we do need to make any alterations, we'll do whatever is appropriate and necessary to accommodate that. Currently, the electrical comes in from a pole right here into the building. It's an overhead wire, and that will be replaced underground. It'll enter the building pretty much the same location, but will be underground, and uh, there will be a pole-mounted transformer added. Um, the, the service is being upgraded from one single phase to three phase. Solid waste will be handled uh, in the same way that the school handles solid waste. Um, basically, the, uh, the waste will be collected inside in bags, and a member of the school custodial staff will pick it up each day and take it to the uh, transfer station. Lighting along, the, along Route 77, we'll, we'll be using light poles that conform to the town center standards and then back in the parking lot we'll be using regular parking lot fixtures. There will be wall packs um, on the building to light up walkways and um, entries to the building and there will be two light poles back here which will light up this, this portion of this uh, rear parking lot. Currently, there is no lighting back there now at all, um, and we will, we will be lighting up the portion that will be used for the community center. The sign, the existing sign from the community services building will be relocated uh, to this location, and there will also be a sign on the, on the new main entrance next to the door uh, that says Cape Elizabeth Community Center. Thank you, Patty. Um, the sign, a couple of the, well, one of the items on uh, planner's list in terms of completeness was related to lighting of the sign, which is not going to be lighted. It's going to be as it is today, just relocated to a new spot, and the, the town center lighting will provide enough light to illuminate that. And the sign related to the business, um, the new business on uh, in the building under 77 is not part of this, and, and that's essentially from our purposes again an existing condition outside of the um, scope of our review, um, which I assume is under in progress um, under a different not in progress. I can. We're going to provide the building inspector, and then the building inspector will make a determination as to whether or not. It's And uh, with regard to uh, a little history, um, I think you do know, but I'll, I'll repeat that we have the fire department, the police department, public works, and of course you all know we have the town council meeting here and the workshop with the board. Um, so in terms of fire, police, and public works, the plan has addressed their needs. The, the fire department had requested um, a few modifications to the to the building to allow a little bit of turning radius to get into the site. We've actually moved the entrance farther down to the west, which allowed a much larger radius uh, for the fire truck without having to address um, our perpetual parts of that solution. It's a much wider area here, whereas down here you can see we had it. It was a lot tighter. So we've got more space, and we're able to do it and stick within the, the building budget. Uh, as you also have seen in the, in the uh, application, the schedule for construction is um, aggressive to meet the needs of this community. Uh, we'd like to start construction if we can do so, with the help of this board, um, uh, in late March after another uh, public hearing. Um, and that is so that the building can be completed in August, which would allow time for community services to move in and be ready for operations when school started uh, in September. So tonight, um, having gotten completeness, and thank you for that, uh, we would like to ask whether or not it's, it's going to be um, required if you would like to take a, a site walk or if you're familiar enough with the site as it is now to um, waive that. 
uh, and then please um, schedule public hearings for the next Delaware meeting, which we hope is uh, in March. March meeting. I have to ask, answer, answer any other questions you may have. Any questions? And again, Steve Harding is here to answer some technical questions that you may have, and Kyler can answer architectural questions for you. I think some of us have some questions. If it's all right with you. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. And you may have said this already, but is that going to be one way that access as well? Yes. yes. That should be. That's going to be two way. That's going to be two way. But the access and back is going one to be way one way. Back. And what, what's the thinking there? As to two way there and one way in the back. There seems to be no particular reason to limit exiting that part of the site. Uh, we have given some thought. Uh, as you also have read, uh, cut through here, which really made sense for the, the two-way uh, access into that site. Decided not to do that, but left it a two-way. Um, the traffic engineer was comfortable with two-way uh, at that location. Um, if the board sees a, a kind of an overriding need to make that one way, I think it would work, but we don't see the need for that uh, right now. I, I think traffic will probably take the path of least resistance. Um, and choose to go out one way or the other um, and not cause any additional difficulties in doing so. Even if it were one way, however, we'd like to leave it the same, the same curb opening so that it gives plenty of room for the fire truck to get in. I think you have to make a 180 degree turn at that location if the fire were up north 7 or 77. Uh, and another question on a different subject. Um, in section six, of uh, the application, you have different types of lighting shown. Could someone just point out to me which lights will be where? On this? The, there's two types shown. You have the town center light, which is the first one, first sheet, which is consistent not with, see if I'm wrong here, not with what's in the ordinance per se, but what is now becoming the standard which was used up at the new fire fire station. We're going to be using those lights along the Route 77 corridor. The lights in the interior of the parcel and for parking uh, in this zone back here will be the uh, box lights on the, the second light in your submission, the McGraw-Edison, uh, and that is um, to be consistent with the lights that are used uh, at the high school and more efficient for lighting the parking lot. I have a question for you, if I could, about the bus parking lot. Um, you've done a very nice job preserving the existing growth and enhancing the landscaping around the building, and then I look at this big blacktop expanse, and I know a comment was made in the packet um, about adding islands. I'm also sensitive to, sensitive to the fact that it's a municipal project and dollars are limited, but what would it cost, or what would the additional cost be to the project to add some islands and perhaps some landscaping around the parking? Hard to say. Uh, not extraordinary. Um, I think that it's probably more a matter of, of um, ongoing town maintenance, uh, where it's going to be plowed. Would be adding the island as required by the um, town center ordinance would, would um, make that a little bit more difficult. But uh, to do two or four islands in there would be a and a, and a couple of trees would just be a matter of carving out some significant asphalt. But we're not planning on doing anything out there except. Um, surface coat, not even surface coat, just seal coat, so that we can restrike it efficiently. Um, it would add to the project, funds are limited, um, but we understand also that the town center um, um, zone, we prefer not to do it, it is in existing condition, um, but we understand there's been some dialogue uh, in the, um, the staff meeting about that issue. And just to add another thought along those lines. Uh, I certainly agree that you know, we have to be sensitive to the to the uh, cost side of this, but why would we not hold this project to the requirements of the town center zoning ordinance um, since I presume we would any other project, whether it were municipal or private? You can make that argument. We are treating this as an existing condition. Uh, it's going to be better than it was. We're adding lighting, cleaning up the edges, uh, but we understand that it's a town center 
zone as an ordinance, and there's no reason why you might choose to waive that for this project. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple other questions if you were done. Karen? Oh, uh, on the on the plan there there's a walkway on the the northern side of the, the space between the barn and the existing historic building that terminates at the the uh, fence line to the IGA parking lot. What is that intended to do? Uh, that's intended to allow for future access from uh, employee staff, uh, mostly from this building, to be able to run over to IGA at lunchtime, grab things they might need lunch. Is there a physical today. connection all the way through? Can you, once this is done, will people be able to? There's not quite yet. In, the, in that area, there's not, there's not an existing fence. The hope is, in keeping with the town center uh, zoning and the town center plan, everything is supposed to be pedestrian friendly. And as we were looking at this plan, it became pretty clear to us that people would use the path of least resistance in order to try to get from the IGA to, to this building. We were also sensitive to the issue that the millwork employees used to do a lot of business at the IGA. And we very much would like to encourage uh, folks who are using the community center to run over to the IGA and pick up a couple of odds and ends or any place else in the shopping center uh, while they're there. So it's intended to, to try to bring the facilities together and hopefully to uh, continue a good relationship uh, with the shopping center. But it, it ends at the property line. There's a little bit of grass there. We would hope to work it out with the owner of the shopping center to, although we can't show them the plan, we don't have permission to, to uh, blend it in uh, okay. to their property. That's a good idea. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the sidewalk that borders Route 77, uh, aren't there supposed to be trees between the sidewalk and the roadway as part of the town center zoning? In that little grassy strip? And they will be. Pardon me? And they will be, yes. Okay, I just I couldn't tell whether it was that, on the... Yeah. Uh, the ordinance is that way, and, that, and that's the way it'll be. This was in quick response to some of the, the memo. We haven't got to get it on the final contract documents. It will be fixed on the plan that you get next week. Or okay, next thank you. Uh, and along the same lines, uh, the there's not really an entrance, there's not an access to the historic building from that sidewalk. If I'm reading this right, you know, to the front of it, it sort of wraps around the side. Again, another, um, another um, plan change is the, the walkway from the new concrete walk to the front entrance okay. of the building. So again, as part of the memo from the staff meeting, we will be adding that to the plan. Great, thank you. And could you just point out on that plan where where this, the community services sign will go and where a potential new sign would go for the businesses that are moving into the historic building? On the elevation, which would be the south elevation, this addition is the one that... That's the new main entrance. That's the new main entrance, thank you. Just to the right of that main entrance on the, the just above the finished floor elevation, which will look more like the middle of the facade at that particular point, will be assigned as Cape Elizabeth Community Center. Oh, I thought there was one detached from the building for community services. There won't be? The one that's for community services, the one that's being relocated? Right. Yeah, that one will be located right here. Okay, but that's not illuminated. That's correct. And then there will be a sign, again, as, as town manager just alluded to, um, associated with this business, which right now I don't have the exact information. And the, that is. I guess there's a determination being made whether that needs yes. to be folded into this. Right. Um, one last question. If I'm at the parking lot by the soccer field, or if I'm at the, the pool and fitness center and I want to drive up and park at community services, how do I get there? in the parking lot way down over here. Yes, sir. You've got to come out and go back in. We'll park in the... That, that's right. Thank you. You can drive right into here. But 
it wouldn't it wouldn't be a legal maneuver to go around the access road and loop back around, would it? Right here? Yeah. I really know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suspect the prime entrance will be in through the the garage. I mean, through the uh, into the that new laid out parking lot from that location. If anybody was really going to make that move, that that's the logical path. Okay, thank you. The rear, segueing from your question, the rear entrance. Why is that only one way? Is that because of width? Could that be two ways? Um, we're trying to, to limit the, the traffic movement to that location, and we're trying also to um, let traffic move us both from the perspective of cars maneuvering here, but also cars coming and going here because there's going to be a play area right there as well. So we want not only to keep that safe, we also want to keep as much space as possible for the future play area. Because that would solve that problem if, if that was two ways. That one, the traffic engineer was very comfortable with this being two-way and this being one-way. If this, if this, if we were wanted to go two-way direction here, I'd really want her to take a look at that. Um, I suspect that if it works as is, and we don't have a lot of traffic going from down below to here, I think the solution of driving into that would be sufficient, and then around and out would work. For for what it's worth, I I can't imagine there'd be a, a, a ton of traffic leaving from like the swimming pool parking lot over to community services. I agree. Where I but think that would be a huge problem. But right, but if there were, if somebody had to pick up somebody, they could come right in that way and out again. I guess I'm, I'm confused now about this whole island question. Uh, are we talking about the parking lot next to the community center, or are we talking about the bus parking lot? I thought we were talking about the bus parking lot. The bus parking lot. The bus parking The islands. The islands. We, we don't need islands here because we don't have a, any more tent. Right. Okay. I, well, just for my two cents, and I, I guess I don't see a critical need for the islands in the bus parking lot for the simple reason that it's not, while it may be technically within the town center zone, I think an argument can be made that it is an existing use, but also it's not on the edge of where it would be seen uh, for aesthetic purposes and given the cost and other issues uh, plus it would take spaces away would it not yes it would uh, I, I wouldn't think that would be necessary i second that and i also concur with that observation I I have a couple of questions if anybody else. Um, I assume you're going to have a mechanical plan in the packet when the final submission. We will have mechanical drawings as part of the contract document set that will be available if you'd like. Is, is there any, certainly give you any outside mechanical equipment being planned? No. It's a mechanical space inside. The oil tanks will be inside. And the only thing that's going to be outside is the is the um, the vent, and they won't be outside. It'll be on the outside facade for um, the mechanical intakes uh, for this building. Now, over here. We were discussing another topic. Okay. So that's it. No, for this for this use. No uh, outside equipment, nothing on the roof. Nothing on the roof side. The, um, I noted, you noted on the exterior treatment, uh, you're keeping the existing white clapboards, or are you replacing that? front uh, we'll be putting new clapboard along and bringing it down. Right now what you have on, on the base is texture 111. And but that's going to be replaced. One of our drawings shows us texture 111. Is that going to be covered up with clapboard? Yes, it will. Okay, so it will be all white. All I'm saying, is, all I'm looking for is to make sure the colors on the drawing so that we can see it on your final submission. Okay. 
and it. Yeah. Okay. Shall I do that? With, um, as I say, on on um, on the side facades and the back one here. It will just be a matter of, of, of patching what, what's existing, and then and then the front facade will be fixing it up a little more. Can you show one fascia there in the drawings that we have with uh, uh, looks like cedar shingles on it. That's existing somewhere. Yes, that's right here. Okay. Actually, the you know you, you're correct. You, you you caught an error that, that, that I didn't see until this uh, until I went to print this out. Um, there there were a few siding errors. Oh, uh, I'm just. Just letting you know that we'd, we'd like to see the colors and the schemes, if we can, on your final submission. We can do that. Um, the, um, just clarify one thing. You're, you're providing new sewerage egress for the building, or you're going to use the existing, or you haven't come to that conclusion yet? There's an, existing, there's an existing sewer exit going from the building to a manhole right in this vicinity here. Uh, there's an existing alleged uh, sewer exit in the front of the building, which we think is abandoned. We have to go back and confirm that for sure. We believe everything's going out the back. So I think what Pat is referring to is the need to uh, confirm and know in certain terms that the pipe from this manhole down to the next one is in fact large enough for the, the additional loads, which won't be a lot more, but we have to make sure that it's going to be big enough to handle that. So that's the piece we have to work with Bob um, with, as well as the engineers for the building. Okay. I, I had a couple, couple more questions here. Um, I noticed on one of your plans that you showed on your driveway entrance a stone uh, fill rather than a paving. Is, is that your final decision or is that, I'm just a little curious about that. That's probably the erosion control construction entrance during, during construction. Okay, only. so that's not the, no. that'll be paved right up. Correct. Okay, good. Um, and one item that I think is, might, I'm sure you'll think about it, but I just thought I'd remind you is that you probably ought to put a one-way sign opposite on that island coming down there to make sure that right there in your entrance and exit right there. I know it's not noted on the plan, but it might well, we, we had that discussion, and I think that's um, kind of we'll definitely put that on the plan. Uh, we got a couple other issues that we need to talk about, a site walk uh, and a hearing. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, obviously, I think we have to have a public hearing. Uh, but as far as the site walk goes, it's certainly, speaking for myself, it's certainly a location that I go by enough so that, you know, if I need to, to walk it, I don't know if anybody else feels uh, like to try to meet the schedule as quickly as we can. Any other thoughts about that? No, I'd agree with John on that. Okay. And I think most of us all pass that site on a regular basis. No sense holding us up at that. So you think it's uh, uh, we can ha hold a hearing next next meeting and get uh, the final approval the same night, or do we? Get, okay. How do you folks feel about that? I I think it's important to give them the, um, the opportunity to try to get get this project underway, they get a tight schedule, and I don't, I don't want to hold them up. So I, I agree. I think I don't see why we couldn't have the public hearing and then deal with final approval following the hearing. Okay. So it's important for you to make your timely uh, presentations to Maureen, I guess. Indeed. And then we'll do our effort to try to help you get this right. underway. Appreciate that. We'll turn right around. Thanks for your time and comment. I could just add one other comment, although it, it certainly appears to be sentiment that I hold uh, individually and not in concert with the rest of the board, I'd really like to, to see a way to, to increase the aesthetic appeal of that giant parking lot. Um, it is in the town center district and I have some concerns about waiving the rules for the, for the town and we wouldn't do so for another applicant, but more importantly, even though it's not visible from the road, it's still a part of what we're 
what we're creating in the town center. And, and uh, if there's any way to improve that, I would certainly be interested in it. And I'd also uh, ask you to consider uh, why we're just illuminating a portion of that parking lot when I think in reality, with all that goes on at the high school, there's a number of, of evening events where that parking lot is, is heavily utilized, and probably more so with, this, with the addition of this building. Do we create a safety or security issue if we've got a dark half of the parking lot? That's a very good question. We had some interesting discussion about that, and I think where we ended up was that for purposes of this project and what goes with the price tag of this project, we tried to be reasonable about adding enough lighting to take care of what's ours, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the extra 21 spaces, add some lighting to accommodate that and recognize um, that the rest of it is an existing condition that's today is that condition. It's a dollars issue. I understand. I have a motion for the board to consider. Uh, uh, be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular March 19, 2002 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Motion's been made. Can I hear a second? Yeah. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, bring this motion to vote. All those in favor of the motion in front of us, please show by raising your right hand. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, if there's nothing more to be brought before the board, I'd like to make a motion we adjourn. Motion been made. We'll hear a second. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All those in favor? The February 19th meeting of the planning board is concluded.